Final video on the topic of representation. We're going to discuss um, a problem and one possible solution to it that has been very common. Uh, and the solution to this uh, has reverberated down and still is very important in contemporary deep learning networks. This is the problem of invariance and representation. For better or for worse, a great deal of thinking in the domain of representation, both in neuroscience and in the modeling work of artificial neural networks, has been driven by an underlying vision of the researchers as if images provided the, what should we say, the, the most secure form of representation. We've noted some problems with that. So underlying thinking here has very often been the kind of problem that arises in the analysis of digital images and the association of various descriptive labels with those images. Now, in photographs of a cat, the cat may appear at many sizes, orientations. Cats take on a bewildering array of shapes. Yet we, as People have no trouble recognizing cats, both in photographs and in real life. This has sometimes been termed perceptual invariance. The capacity of a perceiving system, a real perceiving system, to recognize something as the same despite, despite obvious large-scale changes in its manifest appearance. So we can illuminate the cat from many angles. We can set it against many different backgrounds. We can turn the cat upside down. We can hang it by its tail. In all cases, we perceive the cat without any trouble. And these changes are not particularly challenging to perceptual systems. Now, when we shift and we go to artificial systems, whose prototype of, whose, whose guiding metaphor for perception is the interpretation of photographic images, this actually becomes a huge challenge. And in this framework, it's necessary for a network, if it's going to do something like recognize an element in an image, it's necessary for it to learn to ignore the manifest changes that go with changing lighting, position, orientation, and scale, and identify or label or behave consistently with respect to what we see as human viewers, as the salient element in the image. So again, as humans, in looking at the world, we, we see three cats here. That's not particularly difficult. And the fact that they're different sizes, orientations, and so on, is not a problem to us. But before we proceed, I don't want us to confuse the term vision here with seeing. In everyday language, these are completely synonymous. However, in cognitive science, trying to distinguish between these turns out to be extremely difficult. Seeing is a very difficult term to understand. It refers to our uh, access to the world and also our understanding of the world. For when we see a cat, we see a cat. There's understanding there. We're bringing our categories and our knowledge to bear. Obviously, the eyes and the distribution of light play a role in all that, but when we speak in everyday language of seeing, we are not distinguishing between patterns of illumination and understanding. When the term vision is applied in a machine learning framework, what we mean instead is something completely different. What we mean is something like a system which can produce an appropriate label when presented with a specific pattern. That is not what seeing is, but that is the way that the word vision is worked out within this field. And I'm going to stick with the um, motivating thoughts that come both from theories of visual human visual perception and from work in neurobiology because even though we have identified that the networks we are doing are 
inspired by, but in no way similar to what brains are doing or what humans are doing. Nonetheless, they have been the most fruitful source of metaphors and the confusion of concepts between the fields of perceptual science, cognitive neuroscience, and connectionism persists to this day. Some of this confusion can be traced back to the 17th century philosopher John Locke, in which uh, he distinguished between um, properties of the world and properties of the mind in a way that we are not comfortable with anymore. And for him, human cognition was purely internal and it arose from John Locke's point of view. What the eyes were doing was taking in sensory inputs, which and combining them through processes which we now would consider to be computational processes, that wasn't part of his vocabulary, but combining them to generate more complex amalgams of these sensory primitives that ultimately result in what he would have thought of as ideas, and we would now say as conceptual representations. This idea, as I said, is no, by no means a full or good or even um, plausible account of human vision, but it has been very, very influential. And we can see the shades of this kind of thinking in some extremely influential Nobel Prize winning work in neurophysiology. I'm speaking specifically of the work done by uh, Hubel and Wiesel on anesthetized cats. This work was awarded the Nobel Prize in, I think, 1981. Um, because it seemed to be uh, a very elaborate and empirically supported account of what brains were doing that aligns well with this more general idea of combining sensory primitives towards complex, abstract, conceptual ideas. The basic idea is this. A cat is exposed to a visual stimulus, and we'll look at that in some detail. Um, the stimulus is presented on a screen, and as the stimulus on the screen is changed, Hubel and Wiesel were some of the pioneers in work in which intracellular recordings of individual neurons were made, and they focused their attention on those areas of the brain at the very back, which have the plumbing is peculiar, they have the most direct connection to the eyeballs. Um, so they're known as primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, and a variety of areas around there. The path from the eyeball to the back of the brain is itself complicated and branches. All that is overlooked. What they found was that the recording of the activity in individual nerve cells in the visual cortex changed in ways that seemed to be systematically related to the kind of simple um, optical stimulus that was presented on the screen. A, an absolutely essential detail to notice in all this is that these cats were anesthetized. They were fixed immobile on a lab bench and had their eyes propped open, like Alex from the last scene of, uh, of the latter half of the film A Clockwork Orange. Another movie recommendation there. Um, so they were not awake behaving cats. They were not seeing in any conventional sense. The world for this cat was a screen at a fixed distance and the cat was entirely unconscious and immobile. Um, by measuring the recordings of individual neurons, first in the primary visual cortex and then in later, uh, deeper within the brain, they found responses of individual neurons that seemed to be very well aligned with this old idea of the combination of sensory primitives towards complex ideas. So here on the right hand side, for example, this is schematic, but you can see if in the visual field that is on the screen, we had the presentation of letters, there would be a pattern of stimulation on the retina which would be inverted, of course. Um, and in primary visual cortex, we might find cells which responded to small elements in a local part of the retina, and hence in a small 
clearly defined region of the visual field, and these would be sensitive to the presence or absence of sharp elements of contrast. So a visual, a sharp visual contrast or edge between a white area and a black area might be the kind of thing that a cell at a very early stage here would respond to. And as we go further into the brain, we find that the properties of the visual stimulus that the cell seems to be responding to become increasingly com com complicated. So where at the primary level we might see cells that respond to the presence of a visual contrast, perhaps at a specific orientation, as we move in we might find cells that respond to, to moving stimuli, changing stimuli, or more complex uh, conjunctions of features. So a, a stimulus which has temporal properties that goes on and goes off, or a stimulus which is the, um, the conjunction of a horizontal and a vertical um, high contrast edge, for example. The cells, as they peered deeper and deeper in, seemed to be responding to more complex attributes of what was going on in the visual field. Um, so we can see down there the visual cortex surface is organized. You can trace where the projections um, that arrive in a given neuron are coming from on the retina. And they're systematically organized left eye beside right eye beside left eye beside right eye. Um, and the responses of the cells displayed systematicity as well. If this cell responds to a vertical contrast and the next cell responds to a contrast at a 10 degree angle, then the next cell is probably going to respond to a contrast at a 20 degree angle and so on. So we find this systematic opposition and as we peer further in to the, to the brain, we find cells which are responding to things which are less precisely located in space in the visual field, less clearly interpretable in terms of low level uh, optical contrast, and that one could interpret as being associated with more complex forms of interpretation. This work was extremely influential, not least because it fit this old philosophical idea which we attribute to John Locke. There are many others involved. Immanuel Kant would have to be mentioned here. And it has fueled a specific kind of cognitive neuroscience of vision in which the sequential processor assembling an internal representation of things in the external visual field. This field lives on and is very, very active today. I have to confess it's not a vision of, a story of human vision I can personally subscribe to in any sense. Um, but there are some rather obvious things we might want to note about this. First off, anaesthetized cats are a bit special. They are not behaving, they are not awake, they are not seeing in any normal sense. Um, in 1980, Nobel Prize was awarded. David Hubel, together with Margaret, published a paper that might cause you to question the whole facade, the whole story, because what they found was that if they allowed the cat to wake up a little bit, the response properties of all the neurons varied. That is, the brain inactivity seems to be doing something very different from the brain of an anaesthetized cat, which, when you come to think of it, is not that surprising, is it? A more recent and cumulative reason to discuss, to, to be suspicious of this story is currently happening in cognitive neuroscience where we find that whatever is going on in, in one brain is greatly affected by what anyone around it is doing. Well, it's greatly affected particularly by social interaction so that our brains are implausibly described as these self-contained machines that build representations of an external world. But I'm getting into cognitive science issues that need not detain us further. We now know enough to know what the problem is that network modelers are being inspired by. And so they want to develop, as it were, a feature detector in a network which could spot a cat in an image. We're going to simplify things. An image would be several million pixels, and that's too large for me to draw on a slide. So we're going to work with simple patterns. Consider the um, six patterns shown here. 
The three on the left are positive instances of a particular category, and the three on the right are negative instances. What is the category patterns? What do the three positive instances have that the three negative instances don't have? Now, each of these patterns is, of course, a one-dimensional vector. Nevertheless, I've designed them so that something will pop out at you, I hope. The three examples of positive members of this category each have a succession of ones. One, one, one. Three ones in a row. That particular sub-pattern does not appear in those negative examples. So, assume that we would want to present these as input patterns and develop hidden units which are sensitive, which change their response depending on whether that particular pattern, 111, is available. So there's the pattern we're after, and we want to identify it irrespective of where it is in the pattern. So this is a trivialized version of the scale orientation and illumination invariance problem. Furthermore, there are some generalized considerations we might have here. That is, how much of the solutions should we build in for um, the problem that we have at hand? And how generic should it be? So if we, if we build a system that's very, very good at spotting my cat, but it can't spot anyone else's cat, that's not going to be very good. If we build a system that can spot cats in pictures, um, we're on the way to building a system that spots dogs in pictures. It's not going to be the same system, but that generalizability would be good. Um, we're using a toy example here. So one thing we want to be sure is that however we solve this problem, we come up with a solution which will admit of reuse when a similar related problem arises. What we're going to do now is we're going to adopt a radical change to our architecture, but one that is, it turns out, also inspired by neurophysiology. What we're going to do now is change the wiring, the weights, between the input layer and the hidden layer. Up to now, every input unit has projected to every hidden unit. We're now going to restrict those connections such that only um, a limited part of the input projects to each hidden unit. In fact, we're going to be, and here's, I'm going to make this very specific, we're going to allow each hidden unit have connections to only three input units, three sequential input units. And the three that each hidden unit is connected to is different for each one. So you can see the wiring there. We've basically got rid of a lot of, net, of weights from our network so that each hidden unit is now processing only a part of the input. Furthermore, we're going to induce the constraint that each set of three weights is identical. So we're making this even a much simpler network, a much more constrained network. Um, but I hope you can see that what we're getting is an architecture that might go some way towards our goal, even though it's very specific. We're looking for a form of shift invariance. We want 111 in sequence to be recognized no matter where it occurs in the input string. Notice that when we look at the pattern 111, it jumps out at us visually. Consider what the network is doing, the sums it's computing. In a sum, it doesn't matter which order you add up elements in, you arrive at the same sum anyway. So the fact that three ones occur in sequence to a fully connected network is not something that is available to it. We see it, and it has no reality in the domain of the network. By restricting, as it were, the access of each hidden unit to a narrow window, carefully chosen for the pattern that we're interested in, we have artificially given a reality to that sequence of ones. When now the pattern 111 occurs in a pattern, in an input pattern, one of these hidden units will be getting, as it were, its maximum po possible activation, and others won't. Make sure you can see why that is. So when it occurs, some hidden unit will be maximally activated. And unless it occurs, no unit will be maximally activated.
It may seem very drastic what we've done, but what we've done was actually informed by neurophysiology because what we find, the those early elements in the visual cortex are connected to well-defined small areas of the retina. They don't, and a neuron in primary visual cortex does not receive input from the whole retina. It receives input from a very narrowly defined portion known as a receptive field. Um, as we peer further into the brain, the size of the retina is influencing the activity of the neuron changes and becomes larger and more diffuse. But it is a basic constraint within the human visual system that unit neurons here at early stages receive only from very narrow receptive fields. So in this sense, so we've made it laughably simple, the style of solution that we're adopting here has some plausibility. It's um, commonly found that the receptive field of a unit uh, has a specific form. Um, if the, the pattern to which that neuron is sensitive occurs in the center of the receptive field, the unit is maximally activated. Um, and in contrast, if the, the unit is deactivated, this is called an onset or an off-center on-surround arrangement. This is uh, very simple to implement mathematically. And the result um, that we've just illustrated here can be scaled up now and is used these days in deep learning networks that do actually analyze images. And one way you can think of this is a unit, a hidden unit in such a network has been tuned to be a feature detector and it's going to scan the entire image to see if a given feature is present. So supposing you're a hidden unit in a deep learning network and you're sensitive to the visual configuration that reveals an eye. As you can see, if you scan over this, some narrowly defined receptive fields illustrate tails, some nose and whiskers, but one of them actually captures an eye. And we can imagine that unit saying, I found an eye. Um, each set of units with a fixed weight vector is basically looking over the whole image for the pattern that it responds sensitive. So our bunch of hidden units could be seen as a single unit scanning the whole pattern. That's equivalent to our constraint that the three weights be identical for each hidden unit. The manner in which the presence or absence of a feature is recognized is done using a mathematical operation called convolution. So if you hear of convolution in deep networks, what you need to understand is you're talking about which is essentially scanning an input pattern for a given feature. It has a model inside it of what it is. The weight to it makes sure that it responds most sensitively if this particular feature is present in the image. So we've just demystified a little bit of the image processing of deep networks, I hope. And that concludes our treatment of the topic of representation. But we'll be making representational decisions all along as we go through.